everybody, and welcome again to another episode of The Risk Matrix with myself, Dr. Martin, and my my sidekick or my co-host, James Junkin. Happy New Year and roll tide. Welcome roll to tide. 2024 and us being on Spotify. What do you think about that, Dr. Martin? Roll tide, I guess. And 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 again, Spotify is great. You guys can now listen to us in audio and you can still see us in video on Bear Forces YouTube. So um great way to listen in your car, um, in your home. Uh, but you should listen because we got great things to say. So as you see here, we've got two guests today. I'm gonna introduce one, and my uh my friend here, James, is gonna introduce the other one. Um, first of all, we have from Pred Predictive Safety SRP. Jeff Cease. He is the chief chief operating officer. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks okay, for coming, James, Jeff. Go ahead. And we also have with us a very uh, important guest for me personally, working with uh, Craig Scott over at Verforce and the Verforce team. Craig is the vice president of worker and worksite compliance. Welcome, Craig. Thank you very much, James and, and Dr. Martin. We appreciate that. Y'all are in the matrix. You're in the matrix, baby, as James would say, right? You're in the matrix. Um, so, so we're here to talk about today uh, predictive safety. And uh, lo and behold, predictive safety is sponsoring this episode. So you're going to find out all about what they do. Um, I had a firsthand experience finding out what they do. I did a little bit of research for them and issued an opinion. Uh, predictive safety, SRP, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, uh, they're, they're in the business of alert and fatigue tools, alertness and fatigue tools, and um, it's some pretty cutting, cutting edge stuff. Um, I guess let's start with what, what does the SRP stand for in predictive safety? Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much. It stands for safety, risk, and performance. And those are really the uh, KPIs that, that we deal with with our clients in, in finding solutions to address all three of those areas. Okay, so so this is and and this is a fatigue and alertness tool that that you guys are working on. There's a, there's a couple of things that are kind of packaged in what you do. Okay. Um and fatigue is a big thing in safety right now. James, would you agree? Um, I, I would agree uh fatigue is a huge thing, you know, in my in my assessments and contractor assessments I do for our company and for Bear Force just about every company has some type of policy related to fatigue management. Very few are following it. And if you look at incident reports uh, and, and accident investigations coming out of the Chemical Safety Board, the National Transportation Safety Board, other entities, fatigue has often been cited as a causal factor in these incidents. So making sure people are alert and not impaired in the workplace, regardless of what the cause of the impairment is is something I think that we can utilize to to bend the accident trend that we see across all industries. So all safety professionals and all executives, supervisors, even the workers themselves should be interested in being fit for duty. And that's really what we're talking about. And, and James, if I can kind of uh, jump in on that conversation is, as you mentioned, a lot of companies have uh, fatigue uh, mandates. They put in fatigue programs, but they don't always follow it. And one of the reasons that companies don't always follow a fatigue mandate is the reality that fatigue is inevitable and companies have production requirements that they have to meet. The other issue that a lot of companies are dealing with right now is, is staffing problems. How do I meet my production demands when I'm short staffed? How do I keep attendees, you know, my, my operators not fatigued when they have to put in overtime in order to meet the production demands? And so a lot of what we do, and we'll kind of get into more of this as we continue this conversation, is, is we really flip the concept of fatigue a little bit on its head, and that's why we talk about alertness, is recognizing that people are going to be fatigued, companies do have production demands, but if we can identify the individuals that are presenting the highest level of risk to the organization and apply coaching in a supportive and an objective manner, at the appropriate time and have those conversations, we can not only reduce and prevent fatigue related incidents or, and we're gonna talk a little bit more impairment related incidents, but we can also improve productivity and reduce risk. 
So I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback right on that, Jeff. And I'm going to say, is it, is it just fatigue? And I know the answer to this, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a softball here. Is it just fatigue or is it impairment, right? Because impairment, what is impairment, right? It's not just fatigue. It, it encompasses all these other things. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, we kind of think about impairment and is, is the impairment pie, right? And, and when you look at the impairment pie, Fatigue is certainly an element. It is an impairment. Um, as, as you guys know, somebody that is, is sleep deprived may have a reaction time uh, equal or, or worse than somebody that has a blood alcohol level of 0.08. Um, so the, you know, fatigue is definitely an impairment. But when people hear the word impairment, the first thing that comes to mind is drugs and alcohol, substance abuse. That, that's, that's the immediate view of impairment. But when you really start talking to people about impairment, and when you look at uh, SIPs, significant injuries and fatalities in the workplace, 80% of significant injuries and fatalities that appear uh, that occur in the workplace are due to human factors. But when you really break down those human factors, really only a small percentage of that are drug and alcohol related. And the larger percentage of it is due to stress. It's due to things that are going on at home. It's, it's, it's my mother-in-law moved in. It's that I've got a sick kid and I'm trying to deal with the fact that I got a sick kid or my kid's not doing well in school. And I'm worried about this. And so I'm distracted when I'm at work. These are the types of impairments that are really causing most of the human related factors that, that, that create injuries, accidents in the workplace. And oftentimes it's not even the injuries and accidents. We always talk about safety as people getting hurt but the other big side of safety is improving productivity and reducing losses. It's not running into that crate of supplies and ruining a batch of, of product. Nobody got hurt, but we lost $10,000 because this product right. got damaged. Craig, right. you are the vice president of work and worksite compliance, and I'm sure you interact with hiring clients around the world. How big of an issue is this for those hiring clients? And what are the conversations that you're hearing um, at Veriforce? Oh, it's a, I mean, that's a, that's one of the number one causes of injuries, just like uh, Jeff had mentioned. Uh, it's a huge concern for our clients. Um, and, you know, as a, to have a complete worker solution, you know, you need to know how the worker, like you said, if they're fit for duty or, or not just if they're qualified, not if they're supposed to be there, but you really need to know if they are uh, fit for duty for that day, because these are very high risk jobs. And, um, you know, if, if somebody was up all night with their sick kid, they really don't need to be running a, a, a crane, you know, or climbing the tower. It's, it's just, uh, but it's a huge concern for all of our clients. And I think that, um, you know, I've, I've seen a, 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 an application that can monitor this, you know, outside of uh, predictive safety. And it, it's a really, really nice product. Well, I think Dr. Martin and I are huge fans of this application. And we're going to let Jeff explain this, this application to us and how it works in the practical level here in a moment. But let, let me give you a, a real world example of how this tool would have been extremely value valuable in an incident that I had a few years ago. This incident involved a serious, uh, well, it involved a fatality. We call it a SIF, but it's a fatality, right? Nothing gets more serious than a fatality. And during the investigation, we, we tried to determine why the worker did what they did because their actions were a contributor to uh, the incident itself. Now, once we got into looking at the investigation, we found that this worker had been working 16 straight weeks, 12 hours a day, without a single day off. If we would have had a tool, maybe we could have identified whether the worker was getting the right work rest schedule. Obviously, most of us are going to say, you know, from a standpoint of, of work experience, maybe not empirical evidence, but we're going to say, yeah, it was probably a causal factor inside of this because they were fatigued. But by using a tool like Jeff has, we take out the subjectivity and we know exactly whether or not this worker, after performing all those tasks, 
was 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 unfit for duty and maybe that Im impacted the decision making process so i'm going to jump in here james and i'm going to say i'm an employer okay and i'm going to say and, and i and i know jeff's got an answer for this so i'm gonna, i'm going to let him answer right i'm an employer and he's working 16 weeks straight and he's working 16 hours a day and good for me right because i don't have to hire another guy and i don't uh you know I, staffing problems and the guy likes to work and he likes the money and uh i gotta hire another guy it's there's all these kind of costs right but what is the benefit the benefit to the organization right because ultimately it's the organization that's going to want this package um either with veriforce products or or other products what is the benefit um and, and we talked about these a little bit before we got on the air what's the benefit to the employer okay for identifying what James just said, because I don't disagree with James on on a on a practical level that that guy shouldn't have been doing what he should should be doing, and we should be identifying it right, which this tool can do. But what is the benefit to the company to 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 getting your tool? Sure, absolutely. So um, it's kind of multiple uh, parts of this answer here. the The first thing that I want to point out, and this is to your point, James. Um, a lot of companies look at managing fatigue strictly through hours of service. And so, and that's why, as you mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of fatigue policies don't work because their, their approach to managing fatigue is through hours of service. And they just simply can't do that because they need to get production done and they don't have enough staff to do the production. So the other side of that coin though, James, which I've always found really fascinating is the difference between fatigue and alertness. And the, we do a lot of work in South Africa in the mining industry, and they've got this really great saying uh, down there about fatigue and alertness. They can say, you might be highly fatigued, but if you put a snake in the seat next to you, you're probably gonna be alert, right? <laughs> and this That's is right. really true. It, it's really true. So, and, and when you kind of extend that out, different people have different abilities to maintain alertness uh, in the face of fatigue. If you think of doctors and surgeons, they're highly trained to be highly alert, even though they're highly fatigued. Some people are really trained to do that. Some people have an innate ability to do it. Other people, they're not so good at. So we really take a, a dual approach to that in that not only can we look at the impact of shift work and the impact of hours work, but also how that balances against uh, working in a circadian adverse uh, situation, meaning, you're working at night when you your body's adjusted to the day and those types of things. But more importantly, we provide a 45 second um, cognitive game that people play before they start their shift that helps to determine that are you fatigued or are you are you, well it's are you alert or are you not? That's the way to, to to describe it. You might be fatigued, but can you remain alert to do your job? And if you're struggling with alertness, the way that we approach this, and to answer your question, Dr. Martin, is that we have to look at the whole person, and we have to look at the needs and the demands of the company, and we have to look at, at how do we effectively manage this. And the way we manage it is by engaging the employee that might have, a, 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 might have trouble. So how can a company benefit from this? I'll tell you a story. Um, one of our clients is a steel fabrication and distribution company. They have about eight facilities across the U.S., uh, and all eight of those facilities use our system. When somebody scores in the red on the game, they're asked to play it again. And if they score in the red two times in a row, what that means is that they couldn't play the game to the normal level that they play against their own personal baseline. That's why we're non-discriminatory. Non language independent and all these kinds of things. So we can talk about all that stuff that people want to know. But the bottom line is if you score in the red outside your normal range on your baseline two times in a row, that's going to create a conversation with the manager and it's going to be an objective conversation. That results in a coaching opportunity that would not have happened otherwise. So this particular group with the eight facilities, we track one of the KPIs is what's the percentage rate of outside normal range notifications that happens across the population of everybody that's playing the game every day. And the normal notification rate for people to get these two reds in a row 
uh, for this organization, the average rate is 2.5%. What that means is two out of every 100 games played might create a conversation that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Pretty low rate, right? A lot of our our companies are 1.5%, but these guys have a really tough work environment. Well, one of their operations had during uh, the second quarter of last year had an 8.5% ONR rating, outside normal range rate. 8.5 compared to 2.5 at all their other sites. Now, when we got in and we started talking to the organization, we started running questions, you know, why do you think your ONR rate is so high? What they told us is they said, we were short staffed this summer. It's 105 degrees, our warehouse is not air conditioned, and we have really high production demands. And we didn't, we couldn't send anybody home. We said, I get it. So that makes sense. Your, your employees don't have opportunity for recovery. They're working hard, you're meeting production demands. And they continued to tell us, they said, we met every production demand. In fact, we hit the highest level of production of any of our facilities of all time. Fantastic. And you're working your guys to death, obviously. Yeah, we were working our guys to death. What was your incident and injury rate? Zero. Now, when we asked them why their incident and injury rate was zero, even though they were working their people to death, what they said is by utilizing our tool, which is called the alert meter, they were able to identify those people who, although they were highly fatigued, were, 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 and, and, were also unable to maintain alertness to the level that they need to. And by identity, they were able to apply coaching in a table to reassign people appropriately if they were on a dangerous task. So if I was operating, mostly coaching and eventually managing their people in a targeted fashion, by identifying the folks that are struggling the most, they were able to keep their incident rate down to zero reduce their risk and improve their performance. Safety. Man, I love to hear that because if you follow us, you're going to hear me say this dang near every episode that hazards are best controlled in the planning and design of the work. The work is what it is, right? These other hazards that are exasperated by fatigue, the company looked at that in a non-punitive way and rotated workers out of those particular workstations before we had an incident, before we had an incident. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, really is one of the benefits of, of, of your solution to this because it helps fulfill our mission at Bear Force, which is to get workers home safe from high hazard jobs. So thank you for the technology. Now, I'd like to shift back just a little bit and let's talk about the science behind this because there are a lot of games out there. When I hear games, you know, that's, that's uh that's something my son plays. Uh, James don't play. I'm like Nick Saban. I don't play. Right? Roll tie. So tell me about this game and the science that's behind it to support the decision making process of management. Yeah, absolutely. And we call it a game and not a test because nobody likes to take a test, and certainly nobody likes to fail a test. So you play a game and you score outside your normal range, and that really is what it's all about. Um, a little background is kind of the best way to describe the science. Um, the, uh, the, the, the alert meter is actually a direct result of the Exxon Valdez incident. Uh, the inventor of the alert meter uh, got peripherally pulled into the, uh, uh, all of the cleanup from the Exxon Valdez, and he wanted to find a way to prevent those incidents from happening again. For those that aren't aware, the root cause of, of that incident was that the vessel pilot wasn't rested appropriately. There might have been some concern that he was partially hung over. Um, that's still out for the jury. But uh, bottom line, this, this impairment was at work. Um, and the gentleman who invented this, his name is Henry Bowles. Uh, he went to NASA and he went to the U.S. military and he asked them, what do you guys do to test for alertness with your uh, astronauts and with your special forces soldiers to make sure that they can do their job appropriately, right? The, the snake in the seat kind of thing. These guys are all gonna be fatigued. How do I check alertness? And what the NASA came back to him with and the military came back to him with is this concept of a psychomotor vigilance test. For those of you that are listening to this, you may be familiar with that technology. However, the traditional psychomotor vigilance test or PVT test 
didn't really work and couldn't apply in a commercial situation, primarily because those things took anywhere from seven to 20 minutes to execute. And so Henry took this concept and he went to the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, and he applied for grant funding and received significant grants to create what is today the alert meter. Now, the science behind alert meter and part of what NIOSH's requirements included was A, it has to be non-discriminatory, meaning it doesn't matter if the person that's playing the game has a PhD in computer science, or if that person is 72 years old, does not speak the native language of the, of the, of the company, has immigrated here recently from a foreign country, has a learning disability, and they're dyslexic. Okay, so it's got to work for both of those people, and it's got to work equally for both of those people. And part of the way that it works equally for both of those people is it evaluates people on a personal baseline. We like to, to, to say that alert meter is a skill that people develop. The first time you play the game, you're probably not going to do very well on it. You're going to play it again, you're going to get a little better. You're going to play it again, you're going to get a little better. You're going to learn how to play the game. It's a shape-based game. It takes 45 seconds to execute. There's 21 questions, but the questions are basically, you're looking at a checkerboard on a screen and you see a series of shapes on the checkerboard. And it's asking you, are all these shapes the same or is one of them different? And it's testing your decision-making capability. How quickly can I identify the shape that's different? How quickly can I identify if they're all the same? And you build a proclivity to these shapes because there's only so many shapes in the system. So as you build that proclivity and as you get better at playing this game, it develops a data set around you. What shapes am I good at? What shapes am I horrible at? How quickly do I respond to the hexagons? How quickly do I respond to little swiggly shapes? And it builds what we like to call a brain print around each individual. Then each time you play the game, it's looking for a deviation in your performance around the shapes you have high proclivity for, the shapes you don't do well against the timing on these. And we even introduce a memory and a recognition component to check your ability to switch your executive function back and forth between decision making and memory and recall. And ultimately, it comes back not with a um, not with a one to 10 type of a score. It just simply says, hey, you're in the green. You played the game as well as you normally play the game. Oh, you're in the yellow. You know what? Maybe you should drink a little extra water today. Take a little break this afternoon. Oh, you're in the red. You know what? We're going to give you some grace. Try again. Oh, you're in the red a second time. Two times in a row when you normally for the last two months have been scoring in the green. You're getting in the red today. You know what? Don't go to your workstation until you have a conversation, until you have a conversation with your manager. And it creates those safety conversations that would not have happened otherwise. The, the beauty here, Jeff, and and I think and maybe maybe I'm I'm dumbing this down too much. And if I'm wrong, please tell me. The beauty is you learn, right? You get better at it, but the game learns too, right? So the game is it's kind of a two sided thing. You can't quote unquote beat the game, right? Because the game is is you is the person. It, it becomes the person, the brain print of that person. And so let's say you you know. As you age, your reflexes are getting slower. The game is going to learn that this is this is you. This is what you are, and it's it's measuring against you. So you learn, the game learns, and and the game is is always changing its view on what what your level is. Is that, that makes sense? Is that did I did I dumb that down too much? Or no, that's you know, exactly right. It's it's constantly adjusting the baseline. And we, what we like to say is the more you play, the better you get, the better you get, the more sensitive the game gets. That's right. Right. And so you can't, you can't beat the game, right? It's, it's, it's a good tool. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to quote you here. I, I wrote this down because I thought this was a beautiful quote um, before the show. Right. Um, and, and it kind of weaves into the next, next topic I want to talk about. People are problem aware, right? Which goes to James point. Everybody has a fatigue plan, everybody has an impairment plan, everybody has a disciplinary plan. They've got all these things, right? They're problem aware, right? They know they have a problem, but they're not solution aware. Okay. This is this is a solution. Okay. And and I, I love that quote. People are problem aware and not solution aware. So we've got a we've got a solution here. And I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this to 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 Craig 
And then, then I want to come back to you because I've got a follow-on question on this. Craig, how does this fit with, um, you know, packaging things together? Like, why is this important? Why, why is, is a solution um, to impairment important? Um, because it's uh, one big piece of getting, making sure the worker is compliant when they're on their site. You know, um, depending on the reason that they're not compliant, it could be, you know, they didn't pass a drug screen. They ha they don't have um, their training's not at heights. They haven't watched an orientation video. There's multiple different um, things that, that we at Verforce do to make sure that a worker has it, the correct credentials to be on site doing the job that they are there to do. This brings in a big aspect into that compliance. So now you've got a full picture of the worker, you know, from um, and from their screening backgrounds, drug screenings, yep. those types of things, to their training, and this just brings into their actual their their state of awareness at that time, and all of those come together to give you a, a much better picture of whether that worker is safe is going to be going home safe. You know, and, and it, it, how it works with the Verforce worker solution is this can be part of the check-in process. You know, um, we check in, you know, workers check in to do a high-risk job. You want to maybe have, make sure that obviously they have the credentials, they're aware, and then when they check out because, it, you know, something could happen and um, having that time and attendance along with this, this picture of, that worker's um, credentials really is a, is a big factor in making sure that worker goes home safe. Yeah. So this is deployable as a product within the Bear Force system. Is that is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, that's correct. Um, it's, go ahead. Yeah, and it can be um, used as you know a standalone, or it can be worked in with the worker pass to be able to, like I mentioned, be part of that check-in process. Um, you know, the check-in process can do things um, with worker pass, checking barred lists to make sure that that person is, is not on the barred list. And then other things like screening, backgrounds, drug screenings can all be done in real time at daily as that worker checks in. We can uh, verify that, you know, he's got from everything that he needs. From your phone, absolutely. Yep. Dr. Mar. So. So uh, here's here's my follow-on question, right? This is a total this is a total worker thing and, and total impairment, right? And 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 the reason I mention that is because we're all good at drug testing, right? And we're all good at it, like if something happens, you you send them out, they get the drug test, uh, or they do an alcohol screening, and you got immediate solutions, you've got stuff that you know that's in their system, but now we're talking about things that could be in their system. But are that, that might bioaccumulate, right? And we're, uh, you know where I'm going with this, right? A bioaccumulate drug is marijuana, right? And I'm not going to say this is a marijuana tool. What I'm going to say is this is a total, this is a total tool, right? But but we're trying to to combat some of these people who say, well, you know, I smoked marijuana last night and, and I'm not impaired, or I smoked it before work and I got a prescription for it. And, you know, there's all kinds of things now, right? So it's still federal, on the federal list, right? But, but, but why is this important to add this? And I, I know that, I know the answer, but I'm, I'm going to ask it anyways. Why is it important to add this impairment tool? It makes sense to me, right? Because you can't measure things that are bioaccumulated and really what you want to know is, is impairment, right? right? Impairment. And I, I'm sorry, I got an opinion. Marijuana impairs. It does. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And a lot of our clients come to us because of this, of this conundrum that they're dealing with, with legalized marijuana and the it, it's not just the fact that people are, are, are legally allowed to smoke marijuana. The problem is that now having drug test people like it could have liability for doing that drug testing. Um, and that's a huge problem for organizations. How am I going to maintain a certain safe work environment when it, it, the reality is if I were to drug test my people for THC, I wouldn't have work or something. I wouldn't have anybody to do the job, and that is a true reality in some states. I live in the state of Colorado, and the statistics on the people in the males between the ages of 25 to 35 
which is the majority of workforce for the industrial workforce. That would be a lot of opportunity to see screen tested in a particular time are astronomical, well above 50 percent of them. So if you think about that, that really restricts the hiring area. So the companies are really trying to figure out, and the companies that are adopting this technology that are looking at it from that perspective of the legalized marijuana perspective, there's a lot of ways to look at this, are realizing that they need to change their view of their workforce. They need to look at the whole person, and they need to look at that, 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 that I can't afford to care about a couple's lifestyle. What I have to care about is I have to care about our people that did work. When they get to work, yes, that is the, the bottom yes. line. <laughs> yes. That's not that's just an opinion. That's, that's what the courts were saying. When, when I first got, got into safety, safety most, most companies had a zero tolerance policy, and many still do. And many try to wrap that policy behind quote unquote safety sensitive positions and give you an insight. I'm going to have a good friend of ours, of mine, Dr. Martin, 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 Martin come on on the first degree on the tree and be teaching Dr. Dr. Ray Brown and him going on to discuss this with, with us about reasonable suspicion and zero tolerance policies. But I'm going to give you pretty much, much a advanced view. view. All, All that's at the smoke. smoke. Okay. okay. The fact that somebody is not the joint last Thursday, day, and today is Friday, Friday does not equal a fair. Yes, yes, Dr. Dr. Martin, you mentioned, uh, you know, you know federal, federal law, law, and you're under the DOT, and you and some, 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 some things that will apply, apply, but at the state level, 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 the courts have been routinely uh, deciding for the plaintiffs against the companies because they can't prove impairment. So let me ask you this question. How superior is this tool in demonstrating impairment over the old method of just reasonable situation? Yeah, yeah, that's a really, really great question. And that's it's really important for a lot of lawyers are going to get about how you look at this and then wonder about how this works. A little later is the aha level screen that is sensitive to impairment. It very specifically does not identify by boss. And I want to really, really hear your on that because as you need the EOCC finalized, which means to not not get a medical advice. We do not analyze how to or not how to address us. If somebody comes to work one morning, one morning, morning and they smoke on one part part on lock and SI and they they have the boss knows these reasons reasonable suspicion right away, right away. They're, they're they are not going to take them to the other word in your late late game. You are not a possible suspicion. Okay, okay. A lot of people are not well identified people that, that are potentially impaired. And when I say impaired, it's, it's all a variety of things. things. One, one of which might be, yeah, yeah, I, I typed up that word, yeah, yeah, I'm over and over and I'm still so getting yeah, yeah, alcohol on me. And, and it, it really is a conversation about how to have another one. That has is the absolute key factor on this. It is that to take a moral. There, there is, is a huge shift in the land management. Um, the the COVID epidemic, epidemic that, uh, that back to the big baby boomers as part, part of the whole COVID thing, the big baby boomers have high higher. You've got, you've got a huge, huge number of middle level management positions that have opened up, and you've got, got a huge number, number of young, younger workers that are starting to get into those middle level management positions. The reality is that the majority of those workers. They may or may, may not have a sufficient courage for training and reasonable suspicion to deal, deal with the problem. The what alert here does is, is you get those of those middle level managers that may be not that role and an objective to have a conversation that I'm not about them otherwise. And I'm going to kind of clarify that with a conversation, conversation on, on a, 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 a client of ours that came to us and they had a mentality again. And, and in that particular situation, the manager had recognized that this guy was, was not behaving appropriately. However, he didn't see any reasonable suspicion. There was, there was no, uh, no bloodshot eyes. There was no obvious uh, indicator of reasonable suspicion, just kind of, kind of unusual behavior. Uh, uh, the manager was young and didn't have the courage to say anything. The gentleman got into a restricted area and, and got crushed by a piece of automated machinery. 
and yeah, 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 I mean, I mean, I want to follow on with, with what Jeff just said. How many people, uh, your clients of Air Force, weave this into their program, right? right? Because this is this is a weave in for reasonable suspicion, right? And um, to Jeff's point, there's some liability here, right? Either from the employer side or the first personnel side or the HR side. How, how do they weave it in? I, I know that you've got. Maybe, maybe some ideas, ideas about how their fair, fair force can be weave it in the people who are existing clients. How do, how do new clients weave it in? Tell us how this works. Um, again, it's, it's part of the check in process. So, what we like to do is, you know, again, um, making sure that the workers, we, we know if they're on your site and that they, they've left your site safely. So, we we um, we see a lot of clients that are really interested in the access management part of their workforce, and so this, this seamlessly works with the, the workflows that are generated for those check-ins. So, like if I want the workflow for a train operator, is that we want to make sure that he has the valid drug, valid background. And, and does the alert meter every day? That would just become part of his um, day in his life. That would be just part of his routine every day. He would be able to go to um, the, the Bear Force uh, worker pass, log in. It would take him. He goes to check in for that day. Part of his check in process is to do the alert meter for a minute. You know, and he checks into that. Checks into the site. He's fit for duty. He's completed all his, his credentials. And then, you know, then it's, it's making sure that he checks out of that site as well to, to, to you know, just make sure that he's getting home safely. So it, it's really part of that check-in process. Every day we like to, we like to try to, to, to get our clients to use this as a daily check-in so, you know, that we can make sure that, uh, yeah, yeah, that he's just up to date on all of his training and he's not impaired. So it, it kind of goes in seamlessly with that. So, so I'm going I'm to bounce this to James and to Jeff, right? Um, th this is something that's going to drop into some programs here, right? Uh, because in some written programs and systems, that's James Wheelhouse. Um, and Jeff, I'm, I'm sure that you have clients that, that have dropped this into their uh, fatigue management, to their impairment management, to their overall uh, programs like like Craig is talking about. How does how does this where do, where does this drop in to the program and the systems? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, the the best place to drop this in is part of the site access management project process. Um, when people come to work, are you good to go? That's part of what the whole Bear Force uh, uh, strategic alignment is all, all about. Is it gives uh, Bear Force uh, hiring clients and folks that are contractors with Bear Force the ability to turn on this function as part of the worker pass program. And it becomes really a seamless way for your access control to make sure that people are getting in real cleanly. Now, in other aspects, it might be tied into an existing third party application that, that people are using already. Um, we've got lots of APIs, lots of automation. We tie it in with telematic systems. We work a lot in the transportation industry. Uh, folks that are in transportation, they might have, uh, we might have a rule that says, you know, you can't, you, wheels aren't allowed to roll on this truck unless the person behind the wheel has, has played the game. Um, that's a really big industry for us. You know, there's a lot of camera technology and things like that that detect if someone's fallen asleep with the wheel, but that's a lagging indicator. Alert meter is about are you good to go before you get behind the wheel? So in that scenario, we'll tie in with those those devices to make sure that people play the game before they drive. So there's there's a myriad of ways for us to engage and to work with technology that exists already within the organization and make this a seamless operational component for the workforce. We don't want to add any additional effort 
for the workforce. We don't want to create a lot of change management for the organization. It becomes a 45 second part of the startup of the day, just like punching the clock or doing your checklist on your vehicle. Love it. And I'd like to throw something in here because we've been really hiring client focused in some of this. Uh, one of my pet peeves is we uh, contractors wait around for the hiring client to tell us to do everything as if they're say our safety mom and dad, and they got to come and dress us to go to work every day. You know, look, take some responsibility. This, this technology is available to anyone, anyone as a contractor. If I'm working around high hazard jobs where I'm in transportation or I'm, I'm in injured industry, or if I'm in warehousing or any industrial process, I want to make sure that my workers are fully alert, wide awake, ready to go to work, right? And they're not impaired, whether that impairment's due to a medical issue. Uh, I've actually been on locations where people have begun to have signs of strokes and people stood around and watched them all the way through the process. And then after they, they seized, then they're calling 911. Alert meter could have helped call caught that at the very beginning. Hey, in supervision, we're finding out that this person, something is not right with this person. We don't know what it is. Let's go check on this person. So to answer your question, this fits in a full body safety management system, particularly in the areas of fit for duty, drug and alcohol, right? Impairment. And fatigue, fatigue management. So it's a total worker approach. And I encourage all people to look at this technology this technology is sound. I am a huge fan of this technology. It also helps from the standpoint of justification in post-incident. Hey, we don't have to discuss and wonder whether impairment, fatigue, alertness was a factor in this. We have some data that's backed by science to determine whether or not it is. And if you're seeing trends of your workforce and you're working these cats, 16, uh, week straight, 12 hours a day, and you're starting to see alert trends, maybe we need to add some manpower. Because I know as a guy that's in the field, particularly when we're working remotely and we're staying in hotels, nobody wants to work eight in the gate in five days a week. They're away from home. They want to work as much as possible. But is that what's best for them? And th is that what's best for the company? Because the serious thing to stop production is to get somebody hurt or get somebody killed. So and it costs really a lot. Like battle. And it costs a lot of money too, right? So we're we're looking at the trade-off here. You might be saving money on the front end by working somebody into the into the ground, but on the back end, if they get hurt or production stops or there's there's some kind of incident, then you know what's the trade-off, right? So so I think this is I, I agree with James. This is a really sound tool. Uh, if you go to Predictive Safety's website, um, I've I've, I've given an opinion there. Um, happy to update it anytime. I'm still a fan. And, um, you know, we kind of reached the end of the show here, but uh, Jeff, on our way out, or, or Craig, is there anything else you want to enlighten us with um, surrounding the Verforce uh, use of this? Or, Jeff, uh, some things that we missed that people should know? Go ahead, Craig. Um, well, just um, on the Verforce use of it, you know, we, I think, um just the whole worker solution that Veriforce is bringing to the table right now you know this is a, a huge aspect of it i guess um like it was we've mentioned it it can uh you know not let people proceed into going to a job unsafely and if we can if we can be proactive about you know who's coming onto our site and if there's if they're fit to do that work then it's going to save lives i mean you know, flat out going to save lives. And, and, um, you know, I think that the technologies that we have out there, especially like with California, I know California just is doing away pretty much with drug screening completely. So, you know, there's going to not going to be a whole lot of options in the California range and then people dying, you know, you can use this as checking in, um, throughout the day, you know, checking on people throughout the day, it's only a minute. You know, so there's a guy that I think that died of a heat stroke in Cal in Houston and he, they sent him home like he was, you know, he was on drugs, but he was actually having a heat stroke. You know, somebody, you can have them go do it because it's against their baseline. If you start seeing them act differently, you can um, have them 
you know, go straight to this application. And I, I just think it's a, uh, a a tool that can be used to to really make a difference in, in getting workers home safely. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. And Jeff, Jeff, I, I see you writing some notes there. What what else do you want to get out here to the universe? Yeah, no, just real quick. What I what I really want to say is, is, you know, from both the hiring client and the contractor perspective, with hiring clients, we're starting to see a lot of hiring clients not only mandating the use of this technology, but also paying for the use of this technology on behalf of their contractors. And we're seeing a lot of contractors that are starting to adopt this technology as a competitive differentiator in order to close business with hiring clients. And at the end of the day, the companies that are utilizing this are seeing the needle move on the majority of the KPIs that they track for safety, risk, and performance. And most of that needle movement is up to 30% improvement in all sorts of key metrics, whether it's safety, lost time injuries, uh, uh, TRIR, auto vehicle incident rate, all of those different factors are things that, that we track with our clients and we see really positive movement, which means you know money in the bank for our clients as well. Awesome. Thanks. So Thanks, Jeff. Before we go, if we can, if we're looking for more information about this product and how it integrates with the Verforce tool, Craig, where should they go on the web? Um, right now, we they would go to our website. Um, there's some stuff on the, the worker solution. I think that there's some marketing pages being built. But uh, yeah, go to the Verforce website and look for the worker solution. I think it's verforce.com forward slash gwp is that correct i think so yeah okay yes and if awesome. people come to our website at predictivesafety.com uh please mention that you saw this this webinar and that you're a veriforce client or contractor um that that that'll help us understand where you came from and we'll be able to pull the veriforce crew in as part of those conversations Thank you, both of you. This was a terrific conversation. Big fan of the product, big fan of Air Force too, obviously. Um, but I brought you into the matrix. I'm going to let James take you out of the matrix. Well, thank you for joining us today for a great discussion on a tool that absolutely helps workers get home safe from high hazard jobs. We look forward to having you back at some future event to to discuss this even further, because I think alertness and impairment is a very hot topic in occupational safety and health right now. But thank you, both of you, for what you do and for Bear Force and Predictive Safety for helping us fulfill our mission in bringing workers home safe from all jobs.